Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. So, yet another week turns standard new deck winning the classic. Pretty. Uh, oh yeah, pretty quite different. a bit of new stuff. Yeah. Quite a new, quite a bit of new stuff. Joshua Satterfield's uh, Mono Black Zombies deck really kind of. It's funny given like the you know everything we were talking about two weeks ago. Here to see it in action already and uh, picking up a trophy. Uh, making very good use of a couple uh, Corset 2019 cards. Um, in particular, Graveyard Marshall. Yeah, Graveyard Marshall is the, the new standout. First of all, for only two mana, BB, it's a three power creature just by itself, which is uh, potentially pretty solid. You're not doing that bad, you know. And unlike Scrabby Scrounger, it can actually block. Oh, it can. And. You know, it, it's got this whole card. I mean, I guess both Scrappy Scrounger and Graveyard Marshall have got this um, card advantage engine going on from the graveyard. Uh, but this guy's he's a solid. He's like, you know, little kind of watch wolfy tradey thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sutcliffe's like a way to put down an aggressive two drop that can actually put some serious pressure on the other person while also having late game applications. The ability to potentially just sort of really take over a board if things drag out and uh, kind of a, a, an unsung aspect of of his kit is his interaction with uh the scarab god while joshua satterfield doesn't play any of the scarab gods it's against the scarab god how many decks do you see play a couple copies of the scarab god but they don't have anything worth getting back oh wow Right, like they're maybe they have a couple torrential gear hawks, maybe they don't, and maybe they they have one in their graveyard at the time, or maybe they don't. But so often they're just trying to steal your stuff. They want to steal your glory bringer. You know, they want to steal uh, whatever it is that you have, even if it's just like a long tusk cub or something, right? But if you have a graveyard marshal, you can actually sit there and deny them the ability to use the scarab god. It takes them four mana to do the Scarab God, and every four mana that they save and keep open, you can keep three mana open for Graveyard Marshal to try to counter it. You know, and it's not like you have to worry about they go twice at the end of your turn, untap twice more. First of all, even if they've got 16 extra mana laying around like that, uh, you the you're hitting your Graveyard Marshaling uh, the the ones each time, so it has to be a new uh, a new target each time. Yeah, at some point somebody's running out of creatures in graveyard, right? So like it's not well, yeah, just, particularly not well, just particularly mana. particularly when Scrap Heap Scrounger is also helping with this. Oh yeah, I think that that's like, been an the unsung. The, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, it's an unsung aspect of Scrap Heap Scrounger for forever, right? Is the just ability to have it just sit there in your graveyard and kind of blank some mana from the Scarab God while you're doing well, something else. Well, yeah, limiting the options anyway, right? Like the, like the Scrap Heap Scrounger could definitely, like, slow them from taking your Glory Bringer or whatever, your your Verderous Gear Hulk. But what, the big weakness and the reason the Lord of the Occur... I mean, that Graveyard Marshal is such a big leap forward is that Scrap Heap Scrounger always had the vulnerability of himself. If your opponent uses the Scarab God on your Scrap Heap Scrounger they can get themselves out of it eventually. Yep. Right? Whereas Graveyard Marshal is so much harder for them to try to get out of. Well, not for nothing. You can start with Diagraph Ghoul on turn one, which is a 2-2 two, two, uh, creature for B, and then Graveyard Marshal on turn two, which is a 3-2 creature, which is similar to Scrap Heap Scrounger, but both of those cards have something in common, which Scrap Heap Scrounger doesn't have, Instead of being an artifact creature, both of them are zombies, which means when you land Lord of the Accursed on turn three, out. Or Death Baron. Death Baron giving them plus one, plus one as well. Yeah. But also giving them Death Touch, which can be which can be a big deal if you play against somebody who drops Galta. Having all your guys have Death Touch can actually be really impactful. Yeah, it's... It's real interesting when you're playing like one of these green creature decks against the mono black zombies deck because you're investing 
in like these powerful big creatures, you know, in some cases you're like, all right, I'm going to just, I, I pay the cost to even just have the primal hunger right in my deck. And then you've got these like huge, like four fives or five fives or whatever. And they're just trading with their, their one drop. And the, the terrible thing is they're not even dumb. That thing's coming back in some form or, uh, later in the game. Yeah, I mean, this deck is is particularly good at putting down a really fast, aggressive clock while also having a legit, legit plan for longevity. Yeah, I, I heard a really interesting analysis of the Mono Black Zombie deck, which is that Look, the, the mono green aggro decks have been doing so well in standard for months, you know, even before the new set came in, you know, just for Dominaria, you know, the stompy decks were doing well. The mono black zombies deck is much the same as the mono green aggro decks, right? It's like, it's got good creatures, etc., cetera. Uh, and it can put a clock on you. It's got two power creatures you can play on turn one. It's got these, these high. It's got two of them. Yeah, two of them. Uh, but in addition, if you're just playing heads up, right? You're playing like mono green against mono green. Like sometimes that's just, you just grit your teeth and there's 12 12s on both sides. You're like, I don't know. I don't even know how you break the stalemate, right? Maybe it's about Heart of Kieran, right? I, I'm not sure. Uh, but, I, the green god. Yeah. Boom. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. But it could just be a big stalemate, potentially. The zombies deck, if it's up against the mono green deck, they just Vrask as Contempt your best guy and then come in. <laughs> and they're like but, pushes and Vrask as Contempts and walk the planks. They can be very surgical. I, well, it, 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 yeah, they actually have that ability to be surgical while also having the ability to just brute force with things like all their creatures having death touch. Or Lord of the Accursed making their guys so unblockable. Yeah. So I I don't know. Like I feel like... I, I, maybe this is too strong of a statement, but I feel like zombies is just a a more sound strategy than mono green. Well, so I think the big advantage to mono green, and keep in mind, I like the zombies deck way better. But I think that the primary advantage to mono green is probably going to be that uh, this zombie deck has, uh, first of all, it's got eight spot removal spells in it. And then second of all, it's got a bunch of creatures that are relatively fragile if you can actually press the advantage, you know, with uh, what time you've bought yourself. And the mono green deck, like, so for instance, picture you're playing a red deck, right? I can can picture that. That's that's in my range. (laughs) It, like, uh, red has such nice tools against zomb- black zombie decks and uh, the ability to kind of just keep making good plays turn after turn. You know, when you go, uh, if you play a removal spell on the uh, the first or second or perhaps both turns and then you drop Chain Whirler into Rekindling Phoenix, into Glory Bringer, you can actually put some serious pressure on the zombie deck and the red burn is so much more effective at, at, at beating these creatures with tempos than it is against like, say a steel leaf champion or a Galta or whatever, whatever giant green fat there might be. Oh, sure. Like even dread wanderer, who's the picture of resilience is bad against magma spray. Right. And, uh, you have all these creatures with two toughness that can be shocked or, you know, they've actually got some some creatures that are that are vulnerable to just the core game plan of the of the black red deck or the mono red deck. I think you actually hit the nail on the head, too, about Magma Spray. That's like such a key, key, key insight from this week is the need for people to adopt more Magma Sprays. Scrap Heap Scrounger is already all over the place, right? And you got to have something to deal with cards like Land or Elf or whatever. But Magma Spray had largely fallen out of favor because of the popularity of these various Teferi decks. Well, if push comes to shove, you can make a, a Magma Spray do something against the ones that have the Scarab God by comboing it with another burn spell. Yep. But if you've got a Magma Spray against this zombie deck, that can be such a such a big deal. Not just against Dread Wander and Scrap Heap Scrounger because of its ability to break up the the, the recursion, but even just the 
you know, beating Death Baron and their three mana play that's creating a huge impact on the board, beating that with just a single mana is such a big deal. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean there there's there's a uh... There's countless reasons. I mean, as many as many creatures as you can uh, torch with the the magma spray is a, is a good enough reason. And I mean, scrap heap scrounger. You called it months ago. Like, did the we just kind of toyed with the idea of maybe banning this card. It's everywhere. Like, it's it's in these black decks. It can it can be played in green. It can be played. There's red decks that don't do anything black but play scrap heap scrounger. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, I don't think we've seen the last of it by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Uh, What do you think of the Liliana Untouched by Death being in the sideboard? Uh, I think I like it, and here's why. Right, so the main deck is kind of... It's kind of of two minds, right? So it's got 24 creatures, many of which are very aggressive, right? It's got, like... Uh, Very aggressive. You know, multiple two power one drops. It's got some three three power creatures for two, etc. But unlike, you know, let's say it's like a pure red aggro deck or even a green aggro deck, it's got these very chunky cards like Fatal Push, Fastest Contempt, Walk the Plank that have no text in some matchups. So I really like the ability to bring in Liliana, Doomfall. Uh, in duress, like after sideboarding, like Liliana is this very solid card advantage card here. Where if you just like maybe just overcommit into a fumigate or walk into a settle the wreckage on purpose, you get like an op- or yeah, you know, obviously you can set it up with a duress, right? Uh, you you get the opportunity to land the Liliana, and then it's real tough, I think, for a control deck to fight you on so many dimensions, like. Their number of exile effects is maybe not so much limited, but certainly taxed, right? You have so many creatures in this deck saying, like, look, you can't just kill me once. I'm going to come back, or I have a buddy who's going to bring me back, or I'm going to be fuel for somebody else. So that's a dimension. Just putting pressure on their life totals a dimension because they've got such aggressive creatures, you know, two power for, for one mana, three power for two mana. And then you've got this card advantage engine in Liliana Untouched by Death, that's doing all kinds of stuff for you without requiring any mana. And it's it's weirdly passive, right? It's just like none of these abilities is, is kind of breaking the bank. But in the context of everything else that's well, going on. the third one. The third one's the one that to me jumps out in terms of when she doesn't have a chill mode, when she doesn't want to be <laughs> passive. Like you put down Liliana, you mill them, and your opponent, you know, you drain your opponent for two. But then when you untap and you just play three more threats in one turn and still have your Liliana. You know, I I recall a statement you months made. You know, you were playing vintage, I think, at a a Grand Prix you came in second in. um, And we were, like, chilling on the side, and you said, game always ends when you cast Yawgmoth's Will, right? (laughs) And here's a deck where... You could just have, like, five land in play, and you're just like, all right, I'm going to do the minus three. It's basically a Yawgmoth's Will, right? Because there's nothing else in your graveyard but zombies, probably. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I would not hate, you know, getting to replay a Walk the Plank or a Fatal Push. But, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, you know, it's nice seeing Liliana getting in touch with her Yawgmothian roots. Yeah, I, I don't think you're going to have a lot of Walk the Planks in your graveyard in games where Liliana's in your deck, but I might be wrong. <laughs> uh, what do you think of uh, the uh, the sort of new evolution of uh, Red Black? But I, anything I anything surprising? Oh, go ahead. Just yeah. before, before we come off this deck, because I, I really think it's great that this deck won the classic, you know, right before, right, right coming up before the pro tour it's, i think really kind of throws a pebble in the pond but just the flexibility of the sideboard in, in just big chunks of cards like there's four duress and four gifted aetherborn like you can bring gifted aetherborn in a fair number of matchups it trades great against green creatures but between gifted aetherborn and Vraska's contempt you're putting so much resistance up against the red deck like and it's just not it's not so committed right you're like oh it's not like i, I have this like huge lever on this card it's just like Vraska's Contempt is awesome 
and it can kill Hazaret, or it can kill Rekindling Phoenix, or it can, you know, maybe it's the right card to play against Earthshaker Kenra, and it, which will also pay you back later because sometimes you have a long game and the Kenra's backside is what's going to beat you. Uh, but like Gifted Aetherborn, just like, it's not going to destroy them. It's not breaking their deck, but it's a, so annoying if you get just one exchange off of it. Um, you know, with with all the resilience elsewhere on this deck. So I like sure. that, and I love, like, the, the uber anti-control flexibility here with Planeswalkers and Discard and... So do you like this uh, this build better than Jordan James' list? He's uh, the other uh, player to top eight with Monoblock Zombies. His list featured uh, two Liliana's main deck in lieu of those two Walk the Planks. And then uh, in his sideboard, he diversified a little bit just to Doomfall and to Duress, but he also had access to a couple of Argul's Bloodfast and a couple of Gaunty Lord of Luxury. I do like the winning deck better, I think. If I had to pick one deck only, I think I would like the winning deck better. In, but um, I love some of the cards in, in Jordan James' sideboard. I think both Argyle's Bloodfast and Gonti Lord of Luxury are outstanding. Uh, obviously, he's aiming for a little bit different opponent uh, than, uh, than Joshua Satterfield was. Uh, because, like, if you're, if you're playing against Blue-White or... or Black Blue Control, not Black Blue Midrange, obviously. There's almost no better cards to be playing than Gonti and Argyle's Bloodfast. Uh, the other deck, is, I think, just has more flexible sideboard cards. Like, you can duress a lot of... Like, I mean, let's say for sake of argument, you were playing against um, Approach of the Second Sons. You'd probably rather have the other sideboard than this one. Because even if you're Bloodfasting, you got to Bloodfast into something meaningful. And he, he only has two duress and two Doomfall to prevent the opponent from you know, comboing him out. Sure. I also dislike having only three Brassicus Contempt in the main deck. I would play four. Brass I think the card is just too good right now. About the best card in standard. Like, uh, So actually you had mentioned Mono Green and sure enough, there were three copies of Mono Green in the top eight. Uh, we saw this a couple weeks ago uh, right at the onset, uh, you know, t- discussing like, for instance, Thorn Lieutenant's uh, impact on the uh, on the archetype, but um, I'm wondering what you think of the relatively recent, not universally adopted yet, but the relatively recent uh, adoption of main deck vine mares, such as both the sixth and seventh place finishers uh, from the classic Cooper Johnson and Matt Wallace. Like Cooper Johnson's list has access to the fourth in the sideboard too, but three vine mares main deck. Um, how much of a factor is that in this format of, you know, mono black zombies? Uh, I think Vine Mare is real interesting. Um, one of the things that I like... It breaks like, the paradigm, right? We, of that yeah, you were discussing. It's so expensive, right? So you'll see Cooper Johnson's deck, for example, has 24 lands, right? Some of the mono green aggro decks we see only have like 22 lands, right? So this is actually could be quite a bit more land um, than than we like you know than we typically see so like Matt Wallace played 23 lands versus uh, versus the the 24 and the how much did the uh, the highest place in green deck um, Brendan Hicks at fourth played also 24 lands uh, but anyway you know it's it's real expensive and um, I think that it's it's full realization ha- isn't there yet. Uh, because it, it, we're not really taking complete advantage of its hexproofness. Like right now, uh, that part is only really benefiting from Hashap Oasis. Although it's a very reliable way to crew Heart of Kirin. Um, I mean, wait, 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 what do you mean? Like, isn't the hexproof part like? Uh, isn't that just good against Vraska's contempt? Oh, that's true. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking, like, I think there's probably going to be some universe that we're in in Standard where Vine Mare is wearing things uh, in, in a more meaningful way. Uh, but obviously, if Mono Black is one of the top decks... Well, he wears Ronus the Indomitable buffs just fine. Yeah, right? Like that's true. 
He and it's not, and it's not nothing to blossoming defense for that final blow, partially because you know that uh, he can't be blocked by all their all those black creatures and the scrap heap scrounger they can't block anyway, and partly because you can use the blossoming defense proactively, knowing that they can't veracity contempt you. I mean, one thing I would say that's super beneficial here is that if you're curving up, you're like second turn heart of Kieran play Aronis and then you know maybe you have an open and you can use the the heart of Kieran but then you can go vine mare vine mare turns both of them on in one turn and that's like a lot of damage and you know especially if you've got this like potentially unblockable but certainly hex proof way to to come in on the last turn that's all good obviously he's got a huge power to to power out galta uh i do think the card is um is going to be like a it's a question to answer in standard right like it's not the fastest card so if you're going to try to build the fastest mono green deck it's not helping you there it's not thematically in line if you want to do something like go very solidly into dinosaurs for example but i think from a metagame standpoint if you think your opponents are going to be playing cards like a braid lightning strike or you know any black creatures it has it has some good stuff going on. Like a red deck has. Well, you, well, you, you don't want Vine Mare against the Lightning Strike, though, right? I like that matchup. Like they okay, have, they have to. Yeah, you're right. Vine, you're right. They have to interact with Vine Mare on the ground. Now, granted, they have Chain Whirler, right? So that guy's very good at blocking Vine Mare unless you have something else going on. But yeah. but like most of their other guys are pretty bad at fighting Vine Mare on the ground. So. Um. You know, the, it's three three toughness isn't a huge liability where it otherwise might be. You know, against the Braid Lightning Strike folks. Sure, uh, you just got to watch out. If Karn ever makes a comeback, the ability for people to just drop Karn and then hold off Vine Mare with blocking, it might surprise people how effective it is as a way for uh, black decks to be able to actually buy themselves enough time against Vine Mare. Oh, I'd believe it. But, I mean, those are not the kind of black decks, I think, that we're seeing right now. Right? Like the... Yeah. Well, I don't know. Do you think that they could just slot in Karn the way they're using Liliana right now? It's like so, in, not I in mean, a similar way. So, Scrap Heap Scrounger is, you know, it is a construct. So, like, you could put Metallic Mimic in your deck, and you're planning on naming Zombie. You really are. If you happen to want to switch it and go construct, dude, what about zombie construct du- dual tribal? Look, man, I'm totally more than not just more than the average mage, but more than is good for me, a right tool for the right job kind of guy. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll do it even if it's not good. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Can I be clever for 30 seconds? Sounds like, uh, sounds I, I, like Zombie Construct Tribal is the way to go. So uh, I, I just want to point out, uh, there's not really any new breakthrough in the archetype, but Ben Reagan's uh, take on Grixis showing that uh, Nico Bolas has what it takes to keep going. His fifth place finish with, with Grixis is, uh, you know, very respectable. And uh, Nico Bolas the Ravager is definitely uh, not just a flash in the pan. Oh, man, nobody thinks that at this point. Like, I think, I think that the fact that there's not so many decks that have four Nico Boluses, that's what's bothering me more than anything else, these three Nico Bolas decks. <laughs> All right, fair enough. I, I am primarily playing four Nico Bolas in standard right now, so that's, that's where I'm coming from. But I, I figured I figured you probably knew that you're the one who set me on to to uh, go in dragons. There's a there's a Sarkin and a, and a Spit Flame near you. If it's if you're across the table from me. Oh hey, uh, did you see this blue white uh, cycling deck? Mario Kribart. Yeah, he's he's been talking about this deck for a month now more. Yeah, uh, Herber Halls is a big advocate, or at least was at some point. I don't know if he might still be, but said this deck is the sickness under, you know, just real low-key, under-the-radar, super dope. And part of it is DeGiro's Renunciation. Oh. Having, 
Yeah, that's a spicy Holy little Alex, number. That, this is like an Alex Hain, right? <laughs> like, uh, you know, sometimes you want to cycle for one mana. Yeah, and then you could just tap up to two target creatures from your graveyard. Yeah, and uh, you're talking about with the abandoned sarcophagus? The one abandoned sarcophagus, yeah. Yeah, the miser's sarcophagus. So uh, I, I really think it's in large part just that having access to some cards that you can cycle for one mana, um, you know, because obviously you already have your your hieroglyphic illuminations, your sensors and your cast outs. But I think that once you're at the space, if you just want so badly to just cycle all of the time, then you want to, you know, mess around with less fancy stuff and more uh, just one cost cyclers. And it's not. You know, it's not trivial, the tap two creatures. I mean, you could just play some big hexproof threat, right? But the reason he wants to tap two creatures is to get just a little bit of extra tempo in key spots so that Teferi can take over. Because remember, Teferi untap to land is actually real smooth with DeJura's Renunciation. So uh, I think this deck is probably outstanding um what i what i'd ask uh maybe maybe heezy and you have had a chat about this what are this deck's great matchups uh i mean the the big thing is if you are not gonna get just burnt out like you're you're a little bit slow right like if you're playing against somebody else who's playing grixis i think that's where you want to be i don't think you want to play against zombies yeah, it looked like I'm just, I'm just spitballing here. Like, don't you get like a lot of value from Authority of the Councils against zombies, right? Like, that seems like your dream. Well, he's, dream he's got Authority board. of the Councils in the side. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe you like get beat up game one, but like the combo of well, Authority of the Councils so many, and Settle is. It, uh, but so many Doomfalls and and duresses. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I got to tell you, just on just on. The eye test, I hate a lot of the numbers in this deck. Uh, I cannot cotton one sorcerer spyglass in the main deck. It makes no sense to me. Like, wouldn't you want a second sarcophagus? <laughs> like, don't you want to have, like... I, I just like, don't understand why you wouldn't play four Drakehaven. This is a Drakehaven theme deck. Well, diversifying your threats a little. Remember, he's also got two Torrential Beerhawk and two Teferi. I actually don't mind only three Drakehaven. I, I think there's, you know, I would, I would believe it if you said that four was the right number, totally. But like, I think that you only have so much room for for uh, victory conditions, and that Drakehaven isn't as good as you would want it to be at blocking early, because it takes you four mana. But also slightly awkwardly because you have to spend that fourth mana when you're also in the process of cycling just to get your first 2-2. And usually the first 2-2 doesn't even do it for you because that just turns on the shock or the fatal push or whatever. Yeah, you need to go deep with it, right? Yeah, and I think that it's one of those, like, where are you cutting? Like, he already cut to fairies and torrential gear hulks for the Drake Havens. How much more do you want out of him? I mean, to and that's begin why, with, I would want That's why there's only to, one sarcophagus. I would the want, reason for only one sarcophagus is to, you can't afford to have that much late game. When you have this many one-cost cyclers, you're going to find your cards more often anyway. Okay, this, these are the things that I would want. Two more Teferis in the sideboard <laughs> to begin with. Um, I don't think he has serious enough anti-control measures in his sideboard. right? Like This deck has a lot of dead weight to begin with. Right, because he's got no, 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 no. Very, very little. Settles and fumigates. That's five cards, and they're not totally dead. You can put them to use. This is a deck that has game-winning threats that are very difficult for a lot of control decks to interact with, and it has so much card flow. Yeah, I think like if you, I, I just. Having played against this archetype with the other blue white deck with uh, with approach, I think that this deck is a huge advantage against other control decks. But I've only played against versions that had four Drake Haven and like at least two sarcophagus. So I'm just thinking like, if they have a sarcophagus in play, yeah, you're just murdered. 
right? Like every single card is a three for one at that point. Um, but it's like, he only has three counter spells in the main deck, right? Okay. I, no, he's a seven. Get your censor, oh, get your money. Thank y'all. Come on. Nobody's okay, getting so, censored from the graveyard. That's just <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> like, oh, wait, let me just check before I tap out. Oh, no, no, he has a censor. I'll wait. A like, we're talking about a control mirror. So it's something that's important to note in this, uh, this style of blue-white compared to most. Remember, settle the wreckage is not enemy only. You can settle the wreckage two or three of your own drakes. Sometimes that's the kind of mana advantage that you're going to want so that you can just, like, really take over a game, right? Like, let's say that you just stick a Drake Haven on three. You might be like, okay, on turn four, I was able to make two Drakes because you're like, one cost cycler, make a Drake. One cost cycler, make a Drake. Untap, and then on your fifth turn, attack, get some damage in, but you're like, I can't just keep this up my opponent's going to end up going over the top of me. Well, if you settle the wreckage, particularly if your opponent's foolish enough to kill an attacker in the middle of combat, right? <laughs> but, like, if you settle the wreckage yourself and get three more land, you might just have such a mana advantage that you can just overpower them that way. Because you've got a Drake Haven already. So it's, like, a great time to have a mana advantage. Oh, that's actually spectacular, right? Like, you've got, like, Primeval Titan then. <laughs> Right, right, yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. I think that it's Settle the Wreckage is not quite, it's not like it's great. You have to work pretty hard to get oh, your money out of Settle. It, I'm just the way you're describing it. It seems pretty great to me. Like, those drakes are all free to begin with, right? And, then, <laughs> and you're, like, attacking. You're like, I right, Settle myself. Like, the opponent's only got so many disallow, right? He's just like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> really whoever gonna... settles himself, it's so great to do. That's such a nice added dimension. Am I really going to disallow a settle he's casting on his own turn? <laughs> like, like, yeah. And if he does, you get to keep the drinks. Oh, my God. <laughs> Me, like, I can just imagine being in that situation, especially you only disallow in your hand. You're like, oh, my God. How? It was, it's come to this. Like, how bad is this decision? And separately, how worse will it be if I let this resolve? <laughs> like, maybe he would believe I had another counter spell if I did this, and then he won't destroy me next turn. Well, that, that's see, that's why that's why you need the one sorcerer spyglass. Is, <laughs> is that why? I, I I have a hard time believing that the sorcerer spyglass is going to beat either blue white or mono red more than a fourth renewed faith <laughs> i think i would rather have a fourth renewed faith against both ends of the metagame and i like, don't know if i would ever want source of spyglass against like black green right i would just rather have the flow from renewed faith and the life of renewed faith especially i don't know man i think they just want to i think he just wants to keep other people from uh planes walkering him out yeah, I, I, mean, I get it. I get it. But can you cotton not having two extra Teferi in the sideboard? Like, isn't that just a card that you would want? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, you guess you like functionally. <laughs> I can't like, even come up with a punchline. Yeah, I would want more Teferis. Like, you basically have six cast out, right? But, like, it's. I don't know. It's, it just doesn't seem like I would want four to fairies. Like everybody else has four to fairies. Like, why can't I have them? No, not everybody. Like, if you look at uh, tenth place, Zach Allen. Now, granted, admittedly, it's an Esper deck, but uh, Zach Allen's main deck: three Torrential Gear Hulk, one the Scarab God, three to Fairy Hero of Dominaria. And of course, he's he only got three to Fairy because that fourth one became a, the Scarab God. But even in his sideboard, instead of uh, another Teferi, he's got another the Scarab God, two Lyra Dawnbringers, and your boy. Chromium. That Chromium, Chromium is the reason why you can play Esper, I think. It's just such a great trump card. But, you know, I think we've talked about this before. I just so prefer Grixis to Esper and Standard right now. Like, they have so many of the same, same good stuff. Man... Well, do, I mean, do you like uh, like the 11th place Grixis deck better? 
than uh, the earlier ones. The 11th place one, Matthew Hagenbush's list, is so much more pure. Actually, Four Glint Sleeve Siphon. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Before we jump there, I just, just real quick question. So Zach Allen and his Esper deck, he's got two Lyra Dawnbringers in the sideboard, right? The yeah. Drakehaven deck we were looking at a second ago, Mario Kerbari's deck, has, you know, the throwback two copies of Regal Caracol. Let's talk about this for a second. Who is the life gain sideboard creature of choice? It depends on what you're trying to do with it. Lyra Dawnbringer is better against green decks. Regal Caracol is better against red decks in uh, in a context where you already have the ability to uh, to stall the game out some, you know? Like, all you want to do with Regal Caracol is buy time. Lyra Dawnbringer just wants to win the game for you. Um, obviously, multiple Regal Caracols are buddies with each other, and multiple Lyra Dawnbringers are not. But I was just, I was just kind of thinking, like, I almost want Lyra more in the Drakehaven deck because the Drakehaven deck already goes wide, right? So, uh, is that I, is that crazy? I don't think it's crazy because I also just think that uh, Lyra Dawnbringer is a a much more powerful card, and b uh, good against mono green. And if I were uh, playing this blue white Drakehaven deck, I wouldn't hate having a little extra percentage against mono green. I just don't think that Regal Caracal is. I don't think it's good enough against the black decks to justify it. You know, like it's probably better than Lyra Dawnbringer, but it's not good enough, I don't think, against the black decks. I think Lyra is kind of atrocious against the black decks, depending on how they sideboard. Yeah. I mean, it's even bad against Doomfalls, which they're going to bring in. Anyway. And, and they're going to keep Rask's Contempt. You're at the fairy deck already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's... It's not good against black. I mean, you might bring it in anyway, but it's just... I'm just saying that Regal is not that great either. Regal Caracal just gets outclassed by Liliana's Mastery. And that's just their... That's that's literally just what they were doing anyway. Oh, yeah. We didn't even talk about Liliana's Mastery. I'm actually so happy about the performance of that black deck. It has got so many good cards. How did we forget about Liliana's Mastery? We didn't. I talk about it every week. I know. How did I forget about it, given the fact that you talk about it every week? I didn't say anything because we've already said everything there is to say about Liliana's Mastery. Well... We just said about how it outclasses Regal Caracol, and I enthusiastically agree with you. Okay. Well, don't. Uh, dude, right. speaking of good cards, uh, Flores.Grixis. Hagenbush's Grixis has four Siphoner, four Virtuoso, four Nico Bolas, the Ravager, four Magma Spray in the main deck, four Vraska's Contempt, four Braid, this is like he's even got the the scarab god to kind of top it off, you know. Like this is this seems like a Grixis deck that might be your speed. I mean, he's even got a commit to memory. I always try to make room for that card in my blue decks. Yeah, plus he even sideboards unlicensed disintegration so that you'll believe it. Uh yeah, he does. Um, you know, powering off those stopters. So, uh, I mean, obviously, it's it's hard to complain about this deck because it's got so many good cards. But uh, here's a question. He's basically an energy deck, right? He's got Glinsleeve Siphoner and Four Worlds. He's not basically an energy deck. He's definitely an energy deck. I, Harness Lightning, Glinsleeve Siphoner, Whirler Virtuoso, Aether Hub. That's my point. What is this two Harness Lightning jazz? I, what, what's with that? It's because there's four Braid, four Magma Spray. Um, I would believe that might be right, but I'm hesitant. What do you think? And just in this deck, right? Because this deck gets so much value from the Harness Lightning. Like in a lot would, of other decks, you know, I'd be like, oh, no, a Braid's way better. But in this deck, I think Harness I, Lightning is just... I would play four Magma Spray. Um, I don't know about four Braid. <laughs> oh, my God. This deck is... I didn't even realize at first glance. This deck's got four Vraska's Contempt, four Magma Spray... And subtly, even the commit, like the commit is is good anti card advantage. You know, like it's it doesn't exile, but it does undo uh, just the the typical. I get one buyback from my graveyard. You know. Yeah, yeah, and he's going to see it a little bit more often with uh, the the supreme wills too. You know, like having access to so many exile effects. What do you think about? playing the one Argyle's Bloodfast in the main deck instead of, like, the one Glimmer of Genius he has in his sideboard. 
That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I think it's I'd a little surprising to me. Genius. Maybe the maybe the Argyle's blood fast was like higher impact, where he started with the Scarab God and found you know what, the matchups where I don't want the glimmer. Like, like the matchups where, like the fast matchups, maybe Glimmer is just so slow that it might as well have been a dead card anyway. And once you're at the spot where you're like, I really want a card drawer, but like Glimmer would have been dead anyway, then Argyle's Bloodfast might pick up extra meaning. But of course, I mean, I don't know. It, I don't know. I don't have enough experience with the whole Argyle's Bloodfast phenomenon, but I, I. I'm a little suspicious of how many people just liberally main deck these Argos Bloodfasts, like their life total is just not even a thing. I am a huge fan of Argos Bloodfasts and always have been, but I'm hesitant to play one Argos Bloodfast over one Glimmer of Genius if I'm playing an energy deck that has main deck Torrential Gear Hulk. Like, that's a, that's a big jump for me. I mean, we're, we're it's supreme, one Gear we're, Hulk. It's one Gear Hulk. Yeah. Your Vrask is contempting in reality. Maybe, but like there's to commit to of, memory. Yeah, you can, I mean, the commit is big, big game. But there's there's times where you just don't have anything good in your graveyard, right? Like it's like Magma sprays and a braids. You just don't like. I just don't want to buy this back, right? Like I just want to get ahead so I can win the game. And yeah, I just I don't know. Those games come up a lot. Yeah, I don't know. I I I, I think I like the one glimmer, but. I actually would probably, in my heart of hearts, play Zero Glimmer and Zero Argyle's Bloodfast. What would you play instead? Like, maybe... I don't know. Either another... Either... yeah. I don't know. You only have room for so many fives. I could also just imagine playing another four-cost Planeswalker or something. They're pretty good. Oh, yeah. He's he's only got one Liliana for all Planeswalkers in his main deck. Yeah, so... Now, in all these decks, I just want to play more Planeswalkers, man. I know that there's all these uh, aggressive decks, and it makes you know life a little hard out here for uh, for a Planeswalker. But uh, they're so good. I would just want to play lots of cheap things like Magma Spray to to try to get back the tempo, and then just rely on the uh, the the power of the Planeswalkers, and then the absurd threats like Nico Bolas or the Scarab God or whatever. I, I mean, I think like. Especially if you win the die roll and your mana comes out, like your colors come out the way that you want them to, this deck is just like drop, drop, drop. And like every single drop you make after Glensleeve Siphoner, if you're just like Willer Virtuoso, Nico Bolas, the Scarab God, you know, it could be like Liliana or Torrential Gear Hulk, you're just outclassing whatever your opponent has in his deck every single turn. Like, that's really, really compelling to me. Yeah, if if, if if true, watch out for watch out for Teferi. Yeah, I mean it's it's probably not. You don't want to play reckless magic against blue white or Esper, right? But like against mono green or mono red, like I would yeah. be just all about. Like, here's my Whirler Virtuoso. Don't make me make a token. You know, like here comes my four four flyer. By the way, discard. I have a, I have an extra one because I played four. So if you get a good trade in here, I just have another one, right? Here's yep. here's the scarab god. If you can't remove it, which you probably can't, you're dead. I mean, that's very very. It's like comforting from the Grixis Mage's side of the table. I think, like I just love that. It's like it's so much like back in the day when we were we were you know tapping out for Malokus and Kigas, and the aggro deck was just like, oh, why are your creatures so much better than mine? <laughs> like I don't know, but they are. <laughs> why don't you attack me with your? Tutu flyer. <laughs> yeah. Dude. You can always just dodge attacking altogether. Like uh, maybe approaching the second sun. You could. You could do that. That is a viable strategy. Um, but if you were doing that, then you would have no nickel boluses in your deck. That's true. Blaine Holton's blue white approach deck does have four to fairy hero of dominaria though uh and it you know it's obviously an approach deck and it's got the the jazz like what pull from tomorrow to go over the top but uh it's even got your authority of the consoles in the sideboard does this deck not really just not do anything for you it's just not grixisy enough it just doesn't sing to me at all like i i don't know maybe maybe it's me maybe it's that archetype but like it's just it 
it doesn't push hard enough in any direction for me. Like, he's got, like, two Fumigates and three Settles. Like, when I was playing Approach, your creatures were dead. <laughs> that, that was the way that I was approaching the metagame. Your creatures are all dead. I have all the castouts, all the Fumigates... All the settles. The rest of my deck is just card drawing and approach. And I'm going to out... If you're control, I'm going to outland you, right? And if you're creatures, I'm going to kill your creatures, right? And this deck's just like a little of this, a little of that. I feel like that that makes you win some games that are very difficult for you to predict. But that, like, everyone who's just pushing the envelope, they're just going to push further out than you can than you can interact with. And if you just look at, like, just on a relative basis... If he's playing against the Grixis deck we were just examining, right? I think he's going to win a lot of the games because his deck is more powerful and he's good at interacting against creatures. But there's just going to be some games where they're like Glint Sleeve Siphoner and Nickel Bolas and then just one well-placed counterspell. And he's just like, it's just a bad overlap between the opponent having tempo and a little bit of card advantage. And then he's just going to get his approach countered. And that's going to be yeah. it. Glint Sleeve Siphoner is really tough for decks like this. Yeah, it's just like, it's, it's just too, it's just too compelling for a control deck right now to be able to put somebody on the clock and have such great threats that are multifaceted. For me to say, you know, let's try to bank on a seven, like it's, it's just not the right, just not the right context for me. The the thing I've always struggled with with these decks. Okay, let's look at these t- the torrential gear hulk targets here. Gideon of the Trials, Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, Castouts, Seal Aways. Oh, uh, I don't know, maybe Pull from Tomorrow, Syncopate, Search for Escanta, Approach of the Second Sun, Fumigate. These decks always have so many cards that you can't gear hulk. Yeah, there's a lot of misses here. How do you ever gear hulk anything? Um, well, uh, you can... You Disallow can, and settle. You could construct your deck differently. I got... <laughs> what? I don't know. I, I, and I'm not trying to take anything away from this. Obviously, like, if you're... Uh, you're you're a lot more reliant on the four to fairies than the two torrential gear hulks. Yeah, it's I, just, I mean, just from a straight like deck construction standpoint, I, if I were going to play approach, I would just definitely load my deck up with cards like uh, Glimmer of Genius, Hieroglyphic Illumination, and um, and uh, Supreme Will, because you know if you just draw two of those cards in combination. Then you just always kill your opponent in a three in a three turn sequence. But here you could just cast an approach and literally sit there waiting for your next approach while you're you know while the opponent is reaccumulating um, advantages, which just could include getting the seven life back, right? Uh, versus playing cards like um, Gideon's Reproach. Like this card seems like extraordinarily weak to me for an approach deck. Uh, I, I would rather have Seal Away, which is not my favorite option, but certainly rather play Blink of an Eye than Gideon's Reproach. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a big Gideon's Reproach guy. In this deck, right? I'm sure that there's a place for it, but, like, what do you think? Like, there's literally two Glimmer of Genius in this deck. Like, like he's not even playing Approach like a combo deck. It's, uh, well, I don't know. I guess that's his game. He's not playing Approach like a combo deck. Yeah. Yep. Just playing approach is an added dimension. It's an interesting gamble. I think the format might be a little too fast and aggressive to split between being a control deck and being a an approach deck. Because, I, I shouldn't say just fast and aggressive. I think there might be too much fast and aggressive with access to discard. Because I think a couple of duresses and doomfalls really can tear you apart. And I think that it's a dangerous time to play, to be a mediocre... Uh, approach deck and a mediocre control deck. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that the dimension of approach gives the deck a lot of juice against any mid range deck, right? So if you're playing, it's like one of the black green decks or like one of the ramp decks. They can't just you know fiddle around because you'll beat them because you have approach in your deck somewhere. 
But if you look at the performing decks, those aren't the decks that are winning. So, you know, this deck is going to get demolished by that great Drake Haven deck. I think that the Grixis decks that we saw, which have four Glintsleaf Siphoners in the main deck, are going to give this deck fits, even though they only have a couple of counter spells. And of course, like the Mono Black Zombies deck is going to feast on a deck with this little, you know, you know, interaction that, that's going to be meaningful to them. I think, uh, so what, what's your pick? You know, going forward, would you play Grixis? Um, you know, if, like if I were going to play like in a big, big standard tournament this weekend, perhaps. Like, I don't know, the Pro Tour. Uh, I like, uh, I like red, black, um, red, black dragons with four, uh, with four uh, nickel bolus the best. Uh, but if I were going to play an archetype deck, I would play Mono Black Zombies. I think, like, I would want to test Grixis, uh, both dragons and a little more energy. But I would not be surprised if I ended up playing some lame red black deck. Yeah, but you could just play red black with four, with four uh, uh, nickel bolus in it, and like no, 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 but I could play red black with more mountains in it. You could do that also. Uh, that is I, also an outstanding strategy. Yeah, I'm saying that in my heart of hearts, I would want the Nico Bolas deck to be the right one to do. But if Red Black was the right way to do it, like Soulless Red Black, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, the thing is, like, Dragony Red Black isn't so different than Soulless Red Black. It just it has, does have worse mana. It's not... I, I don't know, like... Worse. I'm not saying it's by a lot. I'm not saying it's by a lot. I mean, that's why I said I would try the Grixis deck. Yeah, it does have worse mana. I mean, like you could draw too many Dragon Skull Summits slash uh, Sulfur Falls and just not cast your Chain Roller on turn three. Like that's that's bad. Um, but you know, if you're just like land a Sarkin on turn three and or or a Dragon's Horde with a with one open and you you spray their guy. It's pretty. It's pretty impressive in the mid game. I mean, you were super right about the Dragon's Horde uh, when you talked about it at the beginning. Like, I think I draw two cards a game on average from a Dragon's Horde that I play. So, that's, yeah, and all that's cool. I hope that's really the way. I'm not trying to take anything away from it. It very well might be that's the right way to do it. I just I'm saying that I would love if Nico Bolas Grixis was the right answer, and I would understand if Soulless Red Black was the best way to tune. Like, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be curious. I want to see. What, if Paul Rietzel shows up playing some sort of a soulless red black deck, I wouldn't be surprised. But I don't know. He might not even be playing this format. We'll see. All right, dude. I'm excited. I want to, you know, uh, I, I can't wait to see what all people bring. I I also kind of think that there's going to be some sort of fancy dark horse deck. You know what I mean? Some sort of, a, I don't mean horse like all these vine mares or whatever. I mean like dark horse, like uh, some su- surprise deck that's outside of what the opens have shown us so far. It. I bet that you're right. It'll get a lot of coverage and then it'll lose to red black. Well, I bet that you're <laughs> right but only because that mono black zombies deck just came out of nowhere to win mm-hmm. the classic. There's probably at least two or three more archetypes like that that are just hiding in, in standard. I'm telling you, there are like green planeswalkers and green dinosaurs that that uh, are explorable strategies that aren't that much worse than the the strategies that people are playing and pro- can probably be tuned in a way that makes them very very compelling against the top decks. How about this? Can we agree that there's probably I think there's a good chance there's a better than fifty percent chance that there's at least two or three more undiscovered or mostly undiscovered unexplored new archetypes to lose to red black right uh (laughs) as long as red black keeps playing cards like goblin chain whirler unlicensed disintegration maybe a glory bringer and a phoenix or so i agree with you but if they switch to playing i don't know um only bomat couriers then i disagree with you Watch, everybody's just going to show up at the ferry. <laughs> see, you next, see you next week, man. Bye-bye. Ghosts in life didn't work so great. Tried to play dredge, you for jail or hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber stasis, please. Lost a lot of friends, got left behind. Had to find a way not to lose my mind. Trapped in a vault with...